Hi, and welcome to the 57th TiddlyWiki Hangout. I'm Jeremy Rustin, the inventor of TiddlyWiki, and I'm joined today uh, from left to right on my screen by Branimir. Hi, Branimir. Would you like to say hello and uh, tell people where you're from and your involvement with TiddlyWiki? Hi, I am uh, Branimir from Sofia, Bulgaria. Been using TiddlyWiki Classic for three years, and now I'm more focused uh, on TiddlyWiki 5, mostly as a user. Indeed, and given us some great feedback recently. Um, thank you, Branimir. Uh, Mario, hi, how are you? Hi, folks. Yeah, my name is Mario Peach from uh, Austria, near Salzburg. I'm a contributor to TiddlyWiki Classic, uh, TiddlyWiki 5, tra mostly translations for TiddlyWiki 5 at the moment. Indeed, indeed. Um, I, I'm afraid I make your life very difficult by <laughs> repeatedly uh, introducing new text that needs translating. Um, anyway, thank you for joining us, Mario. Uh, Nathan, hi, how are you? I'm good. Uh, I'm Nathan Kane. I'm the developer from the United States and uh, working with uh, TiddlyWiki 5 as a developer and uh, watching my girlfriend recently uh, go through uh, using TiddlyWiki 5 as a user. Uh, Great. We look forward to look forward to her feedback too. Um, and Ton, finally, would you like to say hello and introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Ton Trenner from the Netherlands, long-time user of TiddlyWiki, and uh, about a year uh, using TiddlyWiki 5 and loving the latest version. <laughs> Great, thank you very much, um, uh, Ton, and thank you all of us, all of you, sorry, <laughs> for joining me today. Um, uh, very happy. There's a huge list of questions in the Q and A app. Um, the frustrating thing is something seems to be strange about um, Google Hangouts, and I don't believe that I can um, uh, make the questions current. So, if you excuse me, I don't have a way of selecting the current questions, set of them, but um, uh, unfortunately they're not going to flash up, I think, in the bottom of the YouTube recording in the way that they normally do. Oh, I've just noticed that Google Hangouts has switched on enhancement. I did think I looked a little bit less wrinkly than usual. Put it back to original. I don't want to give you... There you go. I don't want to give you a false impression of what I look like. <laughs> um, so... Um, we'll kick straight off with the uh, questions that are loaded up into the Q&A. Um, the first one's from Johan, um, and the question is, how about importing MediaWiki pages into TiddlyWiki? Is that on the priority list of features for TiddlyWiki 5? Um, great question. Uh, there was, um, uh, is, I guess, a um, MediaWiki uh, adapter for TiddlyWiki Classic. And while I was at Osmosoft, um, we did a fair amount of work on that um, under the name MediaWiki Unplugged. And the idea was to make it easy to tear off a bundle of pages um, from Wikipedia or another MediaWiki instance, be able to see them properly offline and within reason, in fact, be able to um, modify them offline. And yes, absolutely. Absolutely, that's something I want to see for TiddlyWiki 5. It would be a plugin feature. So, um, one of the to support that TiddlyWiki's architecture is it has these um, parser modules that are pluggable. So, you can create a plugin that contains a parser module for a particular content type. So, um, I guess there is probably a content type for uh, MediaWiki raw content. If not, we'd have to invent one, I suppose. Um, but then, just as you can write Markdown tiddlers when you've got the Markdown plugin loaded into TiddlyWiki, you would be able to write MediaWiki um, page. Oops. Did we lose him? Uh, supported in the plugin. Uh, Jer Jeremy, there was there was no sound. So oh, you're joking. Can you hear me now? Yes. Could I do, could other people hear me? It was uh, lost lost. for some time. Hmm. I want sound and video. Yeah, it just cut out for a minute. That's really weird. Um, well, in fact, I took a. a, a I can. I the can repeat week, what I said. I think we, um, we, we could hear the MediaWiki stuff. So you said that there is a possibility uh, with MediaWiki and with Markdown, and then it's. Yes, I mean in the same. Um, I, I, 
gave a ridiculously long answer that basically, yes, just as we've got a markdown, pluggable markdown parser, I would like a pluggable media wiki parser. Um, I think the one that we had that Martin Budden worked on for TiddlyWiki Classic um, was a you know fairly small subset of media wiki syntax because there's a lot of it concerned with templating and so on that I don't think we made any attempt to, to make work. Um, but we were certainly interested in that um, uh, that use case of taking media wiki content offline and and working on it. Um, so I don't know if it would be me that would necessarily work on it. I hope that by doing things like the Markdown plugin, that that might make it easier for other people um, to um, to produce parser plugins and so on. Um, so so sorry, I can't click the select button, but I'll move on to the, if there's any questions, well, first, is there any questions? And if not, I'll move on to the next question. Um, so Nathan's girlfriend asks, images in style sheets, is there a better solution than make data URI macro? Um, uh, no, actually. I, I, I'll show in a minute um, what the current state of the art is for images in style sheets. But um, Nathan, what's the um, what were you after? I mean, what um, what what easier way were you envisaging? Um, well, she's really looking for she's having kind of headaches with images in general, but she's she's really looking for something where if she has. Um, you know, the same image across style sheets, um, you know, it's not going to get um, URI re-encoded into each place each time and and things along, along those lines. Yes, that's a, um, uh, that's a very interesting issue that you pointed to. Um, you notice it um, very much with things like the uh, toolbar buttons that are all endlessly repeated um, until you wiki 5 default um, layout. Um, I had considered in the past uh, creating image objects, JavaScript image objects, you know, as in DOM image objects, um, for each image tiddler, and then referencing um, those image objects in image tags, if if that makes sense. Um, so that would uh, every um, image that was needed in the page would then be rendered once as an image tag and. Uh, sorry, as an image object, <clears throat> and then reused. But the trouble with that is that the it, it all happens in the DOM, so the resulting HTML isn't suitable for serializing when you're on the server. Um, but um, but yes, it, it, that's something it would be nice to fix. Um, obviously, at the moment, the easiest workaround is to use an external image. Um, because then the browser takes care of the um, of the duplication or the you know taking advantage of the multiple references to the same thing. So, uh, but uh, suggestions for how else we might do it? Gratefully received. Yeah, I think you know she's she's ended up using sort of a, a sideband images folder to to fall back on yeah. for for a lot of different cases, and I think that she you know feels that it's it's kind of a compromise she wish, wishes she didn't have to make. Mm -hmm. um, to, to not have that content um, included in in the organizational structure of everything and and tagged and, and referenced. So I mean, there may be um, there may be some easier solutions. I mean, um, one possibility is you know how in SVG you can define a symbol and then reuse it, mm -hmm. uh, and you you do so by its ID um, and generally. I avoid using the TiddlyWiki core because it's so difficult for the core to be able to make any assumptions about IDs. It's really something that's the, in the application builder's domain. Um, but thinking about it, there's no reason why one couldn't transclude into the page as a uh, you know, one of the things tagged page template. Um, a bunch of SVG definitions, which would, of course, use the make data URI macro, um, and then have SVG images that you transclude that would just reference um, those images by ID. Does that make sense? Yeah, Jeremy, I think I think we tried a similar solution with Tilwiki uh, with Tilly Space. 
Mm -hmm. uh, when we started to use the SVG stuff, um, and I think to remember that there were different, uh, let's say, uh, different browser hiccups. So, for example, with Firefox, um, you could you could say hide for the SVG um, element, uh, but it still produces some white space at the end of the page on the and and some stuff like this. And also, if you say hidden and transclude a hidden um, SVG element, um, it couldn't find it anymore. Uh, uh, stuff like this, so that there was okay. some, I, I think it's still worth some this, tricky this, things going on. The SVG's got this symbol feature where you can define a symbol yeah. um, that you would thought um, be a hiding problem because those symbols are invisible at the point where they're defined. Mm. Um, yeah, but, uh, I think with, with Tilly, or with Tilly Space, we did some experiments, so uh, there, there may be. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't um, test it lately because the browsers yeah. have changed a lot since. Yeah, no, indeed, they've improved and, a good deal. Yeah, uh, it'd certainly be, it'd certainly be an interesting um, hole to try and fill. I mean, I guess at the moment, it's it, there's going to be some use cases where it's going to be crippling the current situation of every time an image is transcluded, creating a new data URI-based image. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess there are a lot of things, you know, like, I don't know, if the images are in a photo album or something, where, where you would expect the images to only be on screen once, it's a, one, you know, um, each image to only be on screen once. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'd be interested to... Interested to track the cases where it's a problem. Can you tell me more, Nathan, about your girlfriend's application? What are the images? Sure. Well, they're um, the the first sort of site that they're doing in in their sort of CMS system um, is basically a, a restaurant site, um, and it's sort of a, a you know single page template um, with various content elements sort of reused in different places, um, and you know it's very heavily CSS driven for, for mm -hmm. layout and, and image placement and styling and whatnot. And so most of the image occurrences are um, things like backgrounds on sections and, and the like. Um, and you know there's there's a fair amount of image reuse in, in different elements. Um, so you know she's finding there's a lot of overhead in um, in the style sheets and in, in transferring and loading and, and so forth um, because of uh, um, all of those URI encoded images. Yes, okay. So she's using background images, for instance, on divs and things, yep. techniques like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, and in fact, of course, it is. Um, <clears throat> that is one of the things, that's one of the techniques that is going to pathologically strain the system. And, and one thing we've sort of um, considered and, and been talking about lately is, is sort of a compromise solution of. Um, leaving the images themselves in an external um, folder, an external path, um, and then referencing them with sort of a, a placeholder tibbler representing the image um, with a canonical URI, mm -hmm. um, and then putting together some some macros for, for basically pulling out the image URL externally with that canonical URI. Um, but it just seemed like sort of a a, a patchwork solution mm -hmm. to, to sort of a more fundamental problem. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's interesting, though, because the... The, the solution I was rattling through there in terms of SVG symbols, of course, wouldn't I don't think it would work in CSS land. Yeah, um, I think it might it, it might um, apply to another question a little further down the queue, but but yeah, yeah. From, from the CSS, there's sort of a, a special case there where um, you know you're sort of outside mm. the DOM in a sense. Mm, mm, mm. No, it definitely makes things more complicated. Um, but interesting, <clears throat> I'll, um, uh, I think that will um, dig away at the back of my mind. Um, okay, so any, any further questions about that? Um, uh, then Nathan's next question is, how was the week off? <laughs> um, I, which, no, it's been good. I haven't actually, uh, I've just been taking um, odd days off, and it just happened that um, through bad luck um, I clashed with two Tuesdays. Um, but yes, I've been having fun. Um, now, another question from Nathan's girlfriend. I'd like to be able to keep my image tags as is in my HTML content and have them just work when the image is in the wiki instead of either needing to use the image macro or keep an images directory external to the system. So this is sort of a roundabout way of asking for... Um, the HTML parser to 
um, recognize and, and handle um, images sort of in place. Uh, meaning if it, if it sees an image tag with, with a source that it, that it sees as a, a, a title, um, that it treat that as an instantiation of an image widget with that tiddler. Yes, there was something similar in Tiddlywiki Classic, was there? Well, no, actually, what it reminds me of is the handling of external links in Tiddlywiki Classic, um, which, um, as I recall, one of the heuristics was um, if the link target is the title differently, and here this would be um, the HTML widget having some special behavior um, around the source field of the, <clears throat> of the image element. So yes, so I think we could do that. Um, I d the concern, I guess, is I, I was comfortable with those external image heuristics. They were, and the trouble with heuristics like that is that people need to be able to run through them in their brain in order to be able to predict how the system is going to behave. Mm -hmm. And um, particularly in the case of the external link thing, um, there was quite a few steps that it went through in the reasoning. And I thought that that was quite a lot of stuff to carry in your head. And um, plenty of people seem to be confused by um, what, you know, not being able to predict how it was going to behave with a particular text as a link target. But here, I guess, the image source is... Yes, I, I, Nathan, I think that's a, I think that's a, a, a OK idea. Um, and suggest uh, that if you think it's if you think it would make a difference, then go ahead and make a ticket for that. Um, I'll give it some thought, but I think it's a very quick, easy, easy change. Um, yeah. And I, I, you know, kind of went through the same thought process of you know what what are the problems here? And you know, she certainly intuitively expected it to kind of just work. And, you know, I sat there and thought about it and thought, you know, really, I, I, you know, if I didn't know the architecture of the thing, I probably would kind of expect that to just work, too. And um, so, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's worth doing. Um, and crucially, we'd be doing it at widget render time and not parse time. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so, please, do go ahead and make a ticket. Um, and um, then let's see how elegantly we can do that. Um, okay, next question from Branimir. Um, please explain and demonstrate for everyone the new TW Home and TW Browser refresh. Also show how it will behave in Tiddly Desktop. Um, thank you, Branimir. Good question. And the second part of it, I've no idea because I haven't tested it in Tiddly Desktop, so it'd be quite interesting <laughs> to see that I imagine it will work. Um, uh, so let me switch to screen sharing. Um, see if the Gosh, um, they have sort of lots of lots of changes. I'm getting new warnings telling me that I'm screen sharing. Are you seeing my screen? Yes. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> so this was the new TW Home and TW Browser refresh messages. So, uh, oh, actually, I did just say, here's my, <clears throat> oh, sorry. Oh, well, actually, great example. Um, so this is my local build um, uh, of 5.0. Uh, the pre-release of 5.015, um, and good opportunity to test these two new buttons because, um, as you can see, I've got a permalink uh, in my address bar, so when I did a refresh, it reverted to table of contents macro. Um, uh, so what we've got now is the home button that we had before, and we've added a refresh button. So the home button in 5.014, we changed its behavior so that it actually behaved as now the refresh button does, which is the same as pressing refresh in the browser. So now if I press home, um, it does two things. It removes any permalink, um, and it reverts to the default tiddlers. But if I, for instance, make a change, um, and say, OK, so now at the top of recent, I've got this new tiddler. 
if I go home, that Tiddler is still there. It just gets closed. Um, whereas if I press refresh uh, at this point, I get the same prompt from the browser as I would. So I'm going to say no at this point um, as I would if I pressed that refresh button. So it's exactly the same behavior. And if I say reload, then bang, it reloads. And of course, it's lost that additional Tiddler that I created. Um, so I put them. Uh, th 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 there's a default ordering to these um, page controls. I put refresh over by save changes. I'm not sure if that really made sense. Um, and anyway, so yes, there it is. Um, yet another little icon. Um, and I guess I'm rather avoiding <laughs> avoiding difficult questions by keeping such a minimal set of um, buttons switched on by default. Um, what do people think about that? Oh, I like it. Um, and the fact that I we have like these things well. turned off by default. I mean, oh, I added the tag manager button um, since last time. Um, and I don't know if I showed. I've been getting mad for icon creation. Um, quite enjoying um, crafting, in some cases, nice high quality icons, and in some cases, <laughs> some appalling um, geographic liberties. Um, OK. Uh, Brandon, does that answer your question? Uh, yes, I would also want <clears throat> like to ask, uh, how is it possible for me clicking on the title of the wiki to perform one of the these two actions, or maybe uh, both of them in an order? Uh, that's a good question. So to do that, let's. It's like a personalization um, of the. Uh, yeah. Of the functionality. So now. I'll do it. Um, I would normally do this in the browser, so it's easier for people to follow. But I'm going to do this by editing the titles under Node.js because um, obviously we're doing refreshes, and so that's going to destroy any changes I make locally in the browser. So uh, we'll open the, the site. Uh, uh, the thing is always using the wrong one. So at the moment, that's a link to TiddlyWiki. We'll disable it as a link. Um, we'll make it be a button. Um, we need it to be, we need to remove the normal visible parts of the HTML button by giving it the class button invisible. Give it the message TW home, and this is the kind of as we've discussed before. Every time I try and write code live, it always goes hideously wrong. But let's see. Um, this one seems pretty safe. Should we bet on it? <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> so TiddlyWiki is no longer a link. Uh, oh, so actually, let's close some tiddlers. Um, I made it go home, didn't I? Yeah, so that. Um, uh, and similarly, if we get a permalink, permaview out, and then click it, yeah, permaview goes. And it would work the same. CW browser refresh. I think it particularly this approach makes sense if you're using an image as the title, of course. Um, so now, to prove it's a refresh, we'll have a new tiddler. We'll click that, and it says there are unsaved changes. And then <clears throat> I just chose to throw my unsaved changes away. <laughs> Will it uh, will it work if I write this uh, this code in the in the control panel where it's uh, the place for default tiddlers? Uh, yeah, I think it would. Let's have a go. Because um, for end users, uh, it should be somewhere inside the wiki. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Well, look, look, there it is. Um, it's actually there. Yeah. So. Um, I've just changed it to be home um, so that we can see that it's doing something. So there you go. Um, 
an easy way to add the... So actually, thinking about it, one of the questions that came up in the group this week was um, having a drop-down here for being able to choose between different useful combinations of default tiddlers, just as we have a drop-down in the filter search that gives us a few canned searches that we can easily access. Um, and I guess this is a case for having the same thing on the title, perhaps, so that one can pull up um, standard little fragments like this. Um, there's also possibly there's a case for the macro like that, actually, which obviously doesn't exist, so I'm getting blank at the moment, the, but that, you know, expanded out to that button wrapped around the text that's passed as a parameter. And can I write a button inside button so the first one could go home and the other one could refresh? Or um, the other uh, one? No, it would only, uh, only the one that was clicked on, the front one at the place that was clicked on would get activated. So at the moment um, you would need um, and forgive me because I think I can't remember who it was that wrote it, but uh, I think Matabelli wrote a, um, a widget that propagates widget messages. Um, and so that does allow you to have a single button press triggering multiple actions. But, um, but in this case, um, the two actions are, you wouldn't want to trigger the two actions because the refresh action is a superset of what the home action does. So the TW, everything that the TW home message does is also done by the TW browser refresh message. Does that no, make sense? but if, if I like to keep the permalinks, uh, then the refresh will only read the code, but it will be with the same permalinks and we'll have uh, mm. the same no, with the tiddlers open. At the moment, both of them clear the permalinks, actually. Um, so uh, I can show you that. Uh, I can't remember which one we're on at the moment, but let's make a perma view of that. And okay, so now it's on TW Home, and you can. So I did that on purpose. the The home message would not need to clear the um, to clear the location hash. Um, so I don't know. I mean, if you uh, the reason why <clears throat> the reason why I thought it was good that it cleared it is that. A lot of the anecdotal evidence is that people get a bit confused by the permalinks, partly because the browser um, doesn't necessarily make them very prominent, particularly on mobile. And so we had the situation of people pressing refresh, expecting to go back to the default tiddlers and not doing so. Um, so I think for the, for the TW browser refresh um, message, we've got to clear the perm of you, because if we don't clear the perm of you, then we wouldn't be displaying the default tiddlers. Uh, but then will it work the same if you just click F5? Um, yes, I mean, the, I think, that if I, uh, well, I think it was you that asked. No, I mean, the, uh, the, the, I the reason for I wanting to have five, a refresh F5 button. F5 keeps, uh, keeps the perm of you. Yes, that's what I mean, yeah. Oh, I see. Sorry, that way around. Yeah, I that have written sense. somewhere in the oh, of discussion does, yeah. group. Of course, yes, yeah, sorry. I got it the wrong way around. So, yes, this adding the refresh button gives us now two refresh options, the browser's refresh and TiddlyWiki's own. But as I say, the, um, the behavior here of clearing the uh, permalink, um, you know, that's, that's being done explicitly, and we could change it if it's wrong. Um, I think I think the problem is that it is always wrong. Uh, yes, whatever you do is wrong. <laughs> uh, because because uh, I prefer the way uh, as it is at the moment because I find this F5 thing uh, confusing. Uh, but uh, if you if you are used to it and in your use case uh, it's the better way, then you would prefer it in a in a different way. So I think it's always wrong. Uh. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but it, Maybe we really need three messages here, uh, separate, you know, refreshes for both ways. Um, I want. <laughs> I do think. I mean, part of the solution to this is having finer granularity of actions. We talked about this in, in a previous hangout, 
Um, but the idea of being able to trigger a sequence of actions in response to a button press or what have you would um, allow us to break these things out so that they were you know, separate actions to clear the permalink. Mm. And combining them in different uh, order. Yeah, yeah I exactly. Think, exactly. I think the discussion was that one button can generate um, several uh, messages. Well, I've got a more um, uh, a kind of um, I think I showed you before um, uh, some notes about a. Um, I just wanted to add that you don't have a five in Tiddly desktop. Uh, oh yes, I do. So um, I, that's why these uh, messages are important for. Uh, uh, oh, that was right. Yes, because we don't have a F5. Sorry, F5. Yes, I see what you mean. Yes, exactly. Of course. Um, and in fact, you can't see the damn perma view either. I'm in permalink, um, which that would be very easy to fix. Um, but obviously, at the moment, I'm trying to avoid having a toolbar here because I quite like having my content clean, you know, just a whole window of my content, you know, and you, when you take to the desktop full screen, it's quite nice like that, I think. Um, but let's try doing a refresh and make sure it works. Looks like that worked. And let's close some tiddlers and click the home button. Oh, but I did see some. Ah, oh, okay. So here it's not identifying to the desktop yet. Yes, of course. That's a known problem. So, does that answer questions then? So, um, I think um, where I'm leaving that is still open to changing the behavior of either or both of these messages, particularly with regard to whether they clear the permalink. Um, and yeah, um, we just, I guess, listen to see how people get on with um, the options in 15. I okay, will definitely brilliant. play with it, and um, I'll see if something pops yes. up. <laughs> well, great. You've done a great job so far. Um, oh, let me get this guy back. Um, Sorry, I think uh, Branimir should should raise a ticket for the for the Tilly desktop behavior because there it I think it's really a problem. Oh, there is a ticket about refreshing ah, okay, the refreshing okay, desktop. Okay. Yeah. okay. What what's the problem in Tilly desktop? Yeah, because if there is no F5, uh, then he can duplicate them because he wants uh, the perma view uh, to be uh, oh, uh, consistent. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, for example, if I'm working on some tiddlers and. Uh, I have it open and I don't want to close it right now, but other yeah. colleagues of mine have edited the, the wiki and I just want to refresh so that I can have their changes but still continue reading and working on my uh, my tiddlers. Yeah. So in that case, I don't want it. I just want it reloaded from the disk, but uh, having having my yeah. uh, tiddlers open. Well, the, the button stuff that we... Um, It, it really starts to sound like a use case for a for a two-way sync. Um, two-way sync. Yeah, I mean, because really, he's you know, in his in his example, he's refreshing to to pull down new changes yeah, yeah, from the yeah. server. So it's yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, one thing actually, uh, this is a side thing, but I am continually surprised by the number of people that ask for tiddly lock functionality. What that is, is uh, an early TiddlyWiki Classic plugin that was designed to make it easier to save to a shared network drive by maintaining a separate lock file alongside the index.html. And that's exactly uh, how we're using it. Right. So the, uh, and the problem I have with it is that we can't reliably implement it because there is no way with the file APIs that we have in Tiddly Fox to be able to um, claim the lock without there being a chance of a race condition where somebody else claims it in between you reading it and writing it. So, um, I mean, I'd love it if we could figure out a way to make that work. Uh, but what I, the reason why I brought it up was um, I think it's evidence, further evidence, that... Um, 
people really, really, really don't like the complexity of setting up a server. Um, you know, to and and there's so often I think we see situations that would be, if not trivial, you know, a lot simpler to deal with if you were just working with a um, an ordinary client server edition. And yet we see people going to enormous lengths trying to avoid that. Uh, yeah, some, sometimes you are just restrained by the organization you work with, because uh, yeah, asking yeah. for a server is mm. it's absolutely impossible. You have disaster recovery, you have backups, yeah. you have responsibility, security, etc. So it's impossible. And the, okay. well, funnily enough, that um, uh, brings me to the, some one of two things that cropped up this week. I, I transferred over this text um, about the, talking about TillyWiki as a guerrilla wiki. Um, and um, this, I, so this is text is on Tillywiki Classic, but um, this is me talking when I was working at BT, and it was particularly there, which is a very locked down corporate environment, um, that I saw how powerful it is to be able to avail yourself of a software tool in that kind of environment that doesn't have any of the normal infrastructure requirements. Um, uh, but, yeah, but yes, um, I recognize the the problem. Um, the, the other very interesting thing was in the course of this week, we discovered that um, uh, uh, in the dev group, um, Fred, uh, who you will all know from the early days of Osmosoft, um, pointed out this extraordinarily fascinating thing that the much neglected um, web dav um, ha allows you to simply do an HTTP put to um, save changes. So Fred has done a hack together a, a web dav saver. Um, and I don't know if any, I'd been familiar with web dav before. It used to be. Um, I don't know, 10 years ago or something, it was quite a cool protocol because it let you add um, web-based, you know, HTTP-based um, uh, virtual disks to your local machine. Um, uh, but WebDAV is this weird beast built on top of HTTP um, uh, and not at all like HTTP, trying rather to force something completely different over the top of HTTP. Um, but what we can see here is that it's doing a completely vanilla HTTP put. So essentially it's turned out that all of that complexity that WebDAV introduces is entirely optional. Um, the thing that's really cool about it is that um, it supports e-tags, or well, rephrase that, typical WebDAV servers support e-tags as their way of doing content um, you know, um, Oh, what do you call it? Conflict resolution, um, which we ought to be able to pick up. Um, so, um, to the extent that WebDAV is still around out there in corporate environments, so I don't know if, for instance, if SharePoint used to support WebDAV, I don't know if it does now. Um, uh, but working, oh, yes, looks like it, you can. SharePoint 213. 2013. So, don't know. Maybe that'll give us some more options. Yeah, but this also this also needs uh, a web dev installation uh, has to be already there. But so that's what I'm saying is that lots of yeah. corporates have um, SharePoint, and uh -huh. if SharePoint is web dev compatible, as I believe it to be. Typically, to create a, a, a web dev folder, you know, that is the kind of right that even a paranoid IT department does delegate to people on the ground um, because, you know, they love saving their Excel files, don't they? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, okay. Now, second question from... Nathan's girlfriend, third question from Nathan's girlfriend. I'd like to optionally file out and or serve my content in the form of multi-page applications that keep a unified administrative single-page interface for the system. Is there a better way to handle serving this and linking between pages? Okay, so I think 
This is, um, wouldn't it be cool if you could do this? So I'll start the server version of TiddlyWiki and then uh, bring it up. And I think what we'd like to be able to do is that um, and, then, and get an HTML um, representation of that Tiddler, the static HTML representation of that Tiddler that lets you jump between links. Is that what you mean? More or less. I, I mean, her. I'll, I'll tell you what she's doing now. Um, she's she's running the server um, under uh, IIS node in IIS okay. and creating multiple virtual application directories that launch different server instances that serve up different sites or different pages on the different URLs. Um, but then she sort of has to manually manage linking between them and doesn't really have any um, representation of the linking internal to the system itself. Um, and she's kind of got this problem of now she has, you know, five, six different server instances and doesn't really have a, a single unified uh, interface to that content anymore. How interesting. And so the, the different instances, do they have different Tiddler stores? Um, well, that's sort of, you know, the problem. Um, yes, they do, but, um, uh, you know, she kind of wants to get away from that. What she'd like to see, I mean, what she'd really like to see is is sort of this magical scenario where... Um, she can have a tiddler that sort of specifies all of her routes for the server and all of her uh, root pages ah, and their page templates and yeah. content types and all at once. That's sort of her, her ideal scenario. Okay. So um, we're on the same page. That's what I would like too. Um, <clears throat> I think we ought to be able to do exactly that um, because basically everything that we serve um, is always a, um, either a raw tiddler or a rendering of a tiddler. So there's a very small number of elements from which routes can be made, I think, um, and with uh, some judicious exposure of regexps, I think we can do exactly that, yes. I'm very interested in that too. I mean, I'm aware that some of that stuff can be done uh, you know, at a proxy level, I think, but that's a whole nother dose of complexity that is in any right. event right. rather duplicating work that TiddlyWiki is already doing and that could be more flexible. So we, we, we know, talked about this before. Oh, go on, sorry. No, sorry, Nathan, you can Um, That was, you know, sort of my first suggestion to her on that was, you know, to leverage um, some of the, the features of TiddlyWeb or TiddlySpace to, to do that. Um, and, you know, actually that's come up as a solution to a lot of, or a potential solution to a lot of the problems she's run into, and she's very resistant to do that um, just because she sort of has this mentality of, yeah. you know, hey, I'm already running yeah. TiddlyWeek's yeah. server, yeah. why do I need this other yeah. server? And yeah. B, you know, I just struggled with, you know, learning this JavaScript Node.js yeah. environment and getting it, you know, all vetted yeah. in with the IT guys and getting IIS nodes set up and all of that, and now you're telling me I need some Python thing? Yeah. You know, so so she's, she was very, very um, reluctant to take that as, as an answer to yeah. any problems. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's... Um, uh, I'm highly sympathetic. We, we talked before, a long time ago, actually, uh, about yeah. how... I had, didn't make much effort, but wanted the server to be vaguely um, uh, Express compatible. I think that's the, um, uh, the, the, the one that's established a lot of uh, conventions here. Um, and the, I, what I'd like is to, for people to easily be able to plug in the full Express if they would like to, um, so that we, rather as we do with the fake DOM, we ship with some teeny tiny implementation. Um, and, and yes, all this stuff where the actual root handlers are, um, uh, you, no you notice there's a hell of a lot of commonality between each of them. Um, so as I say, I think we can indeed make those be declar declarative configuration. And, you know, the Express interfacing is something that I've taken a couple of passes at in, in the past and never really mm. been happy with how it's, how it's come together. But, but, you know, maybe you're right in that, in that those two things should kind of be revisited hand in hand. There might be some, some better solutions that present. I think, um, I mean, I think we just, 
the, the, the server file at the moment is about 300 lines, um, so it's certainly not one of the embarrassing ones like Wiki.js, but, <laughs> or Wiki.js. but it's certainly, is, there's enough sort of going on that I think um, breaking it apart somehow and making it more modular would be uh, a good first step. And, and really, I, don't, I shouldn't be writing a lot of this type of code, I think, um, because HTTP handling, I, I believe, is error-prone, and um, all those you know, projects that have been hardened with usage um, must have details that would be um, useful for us. Um, OK, so that... That, um, Nathan, goes into my sort of um, uh, post 1.0, although I mustn't use the term 1.0 for a product that's at version 5.0, but you know what I mean. Um, mm -hmm. There's uh, a lot of the considerations in my head at the moment have been around trying to isolate the sort of big ticket items that we haven't done yet, and such as this and just thinking through whether it can be done um, after the release without breaking things. Um, and to give you a taste of that, um, there's some quite fundamental um, changes that have been percolating for a while that I think I can do in a completely backwards compatible way. And the key one is making it so that the Tiddler store is basically the, done through the variable mechanism so that subtrees of the widget tree can override the um, wiki store so that a given tiddler will appear to have a different value in a different part of the tree. And that will unify two different mechanisms at the moment. Um, and the, that's a desirable thing to do in of itself. Um, but the um, particular motivation is that it will allow us to do the import handling much more neatly. So, you know, the, the pending import tiddler that gives you a preview, a limitation of that is that the preview takes place or is rendered in the context of the host wiki. So if you're previewing a tiddler that transcludes another tiddler that's in the pending import um, pot, uh, then it won't be transcluded correctly. Um, so, so it wasn't, perhaps that was inappropriate to dive into that so briefly, but um, uh, I'm really just trying to make the point that that's rather the game for this last four weeks now. I'm hoping that we'll do um, the full release on the 20th of September. So we've got four weeks, and that means almost no time to do anything big, um, I would say. Sure. Um, so, Nathan says, some titles don't save through to the server right now, such as CSS slash foo, so gosh, or save as an empty file. That's interesting. So, I'm running the server, aren't I? Um, <laughs> I've actually, um, I've, I've, I've found a couple of cases now um, that that hit on this, and it appears to actually it, it's starting to look like it's two separate bugs that that may be related Ooh. in some fashion. Um, but any tiddlers that that start with a, an initial slash um, um, appear to not get saved. Um, and tiddlers, oh, what was it? Um, there was I was doing wow. the import. Yeah. And there was the tiddler. I don't remember the title. I don't think it started with with a slash, but maybe it was a system tiddler. Yeah. Um. And when it did the import, when it saved the, the server, it actually saved an empty tid file. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> well, so okay. Just, so, so I mean, this this bug anyway, the backslash bug. That's um, that's easy to duplicate. Say, so I will. Whoa! But it's it's broken things so that even a subsequent to yes. doesn't get saved. Wow! Yep, and wow. it's been a head scratcher. I started to to dig through wow. the code on it and got very confused and very lost as to what was going wow. on, and and kind of said, "Screw this!" <laughs> wow! 
Yep, that's a fun one. Wow. Okay, so let me just make a note of that um, to make sure that I don't forget. Um, And then the the other bug I don't I don't have a, a a nice easy way to tell you how to replicate it just yet. Um, um, we've hit it once or twice and and I can't seem to make it do it consistently. Um, so no, once I that, do that, I'll but, get back to you. <laughs> uh, but it's the same symptom. So um, from what you're Very saying. Very similar. Yes. Uh, yeah. So maybe. It does actually get the sync request off to the server, but the oh. server just saves an empty file. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes, okay. So that is different, yes. Oh, well, yeah. great. Uh, I'll have fun with this one anyway. Um, that looks like a fun head scratcher. Don't you love it when that kind of madness happens? <laughs> um, uh, uh, girlfriend asks, part four, import utilities. Can I bulk tag and or name prefix on import set fields, drag and drop a folder, and keep paths? This okay, loosely related at all to tag rename based on a filter would be super handy. Okay, so I think there's three uh, uh, there's three bits of this. Um, so, and the answer to all of them is probably yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the import handling, and let's just set up an import so that we can see it happening. Um, um, <clears throat> whoa, big font, sorry. Um, okay. So I talked, I think, last week about, or la sorry, the last hangout, that this pending import tiddler um, is internally a um, plugin tiddler. Um, so you can see it's got plugin type import. Um, type is application JSON. Um, and uh, um, it's got a special, it's being rendered specially to hide what would normally be displayed for a plugin tiddler, which is its, um, its content. Um, now, the purpose of doing this is so that we've got a kind of quarantine area. So the values of these tiddlers, these incoming tiddlers, are here. So we can do operations on them um, before we actually pull them in and replace you know, any existing tiddlers with the same title. So the plan is to extend this quite a bit. So for tiddlers that already exist in the current wiki, you ought to be able to see a diff of them. Um, and that starts to make the import function useful for synchronizing changes from multiple people um, so that you'd be able to do a, you know, give four people a copy of the same wiki, have them save their own changes, and then when you do an import, you would be able to review the diffs in order to decide um, how to merge the changes. And, of course, if you chose to not import a particular tiddler, you can just copy and paste its content would be the idea. So um, the main focus for that for me was search and replace. Um, so it strikes me, I, you know, there's, there's global search and replace in my editor, for instance, um, but it's terrible at letting me review which of the changes that I want to commit or not. Um, and basically what you end up having to do, what you end up doing is having, say, if there were 50 tiddlers with the search and replace string in, they'd all be opened um, as having unsaved changes, and then you'd have to selectively close and save the ones that you want to commit. So um, want to be able to do better than that. Um, so then the second part of your girlfriend's question was about doing arbitrary manipulations. There's a couple of um, aspects to that. So yes, it would be nice to be able to perform bulk operations on tiddlers selected with these checkboxes. Um, it would be nice to expose those bulk operations via 
I think renaming this guy to be um, manager and then have tags as one of the tabs within it and then one of the other tabs being bulk operations and the bulk operation tag would basically um, have you choose uh, a filter um, oh, stupid example um, choose a filter and then be able to <clears throat> check and uncheck individual items and then to have a block of actions that you can perform. It strikes me that there's an opportunity to make those actions be um, you know, highly configurable via tag so that say if one of the routine actions that you were doing when importing content I don't know, from another author was to proceed it with Jeremy Dash then I ought to somehow within this bulk operator thing be able to um, uh, make a button appear that um, rather than prompting me for a prefix you know has the prefix hard coded within it um, I quite like that kind of um, you know building building a user interface that's custom for the specific content that you're working on um, which is it sort of takes you into the territory of Excel macros back when you know macros were keyboard um, recording. Um, so quite a few, you can see a trend here, Nathan. That um, a few of these things are um, are kind of big-ish features that I'm very keen on that are deferred to that will be deferred till after the full release. Um, but I haven't covered drag and drop a folder and keep paths. Um, the um, the problem there is that Chrome hides the path from you, um, goes to great lengths to hide the path. Um, from actually, you. since since Chrome 21, um, they do have a um, um, it, you know it's not standardized or anything yet. They're still pushing through standards forums, um, but they do have the ability to um, iterate a dropped directory with the file system API. Um, and uh, you know, I sort of dug into this a little Ooh, bit after we had asked I about it. You mean okay? So you weren't asking the question I thought you meant. You you didn't mean keeping the path for an individual file. You mean keep the subpath for an item within a folder? Yeah, that would be amazing. Great. Right, meaning I, I you know, know, one of her big things, sort of with you know, this question in general, sort of relates to they have a, a bunch of legacy content. Um, images and and you know uh, post files and and such um, that they want to pull into their CMS organizational structure, and she'd love when you know she's given yeah, some new set yeah. of assets to just be able to drop that folder there and have it pull everything in individually. Yeah, well, great. Uh, let's make a um, uh, let's make a ticket for that. To support um, dropping folders. Um, um, we don't, and we should. It would be incredibly useful. Um, uh, and uh, with regards to the import in general, um, you know, I really love the idea of sort of a general purpose manager um, to be able to to you know sort of make bulk operation changes. Um, but it really is kind of critical that there at least be um, some facility for tagging or or name prefixing. Um, in the import step itself, mm -hmm. just so you have a way to refer back to those, you know, that batch of imported items. Um, well, the idea of the idea would be to reuse that same bulk feature. So when you're making bulk changes, um, you would again um, the changes would be in a pending um, box. Ah, so okay, I see what you mean. Because I think a lot of those bulk operations, we need to try them out because um, uh, you know, you know it's, hard, it's hard to get, I don't know if you're doing a regex search or something, it's hard to get it right and you want to be able to dry run it. Um, so good questions, Nathan. Plenty to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, girlfriend points out, searching the docs is hard. I spent a lot of time just in realizing that I wanted to be searching for the keyword clone and not copy to find out about duplicating a tiddler. Can we get a did you mean or search suggestions feature? Um, so I think there's two things here. So, so one thing that I can do with other people's help is to make the content uh, easier to search. So for instance, this is a great example that um, uh, the um, let's see what where clone is mentioned, but that um, 
in the docs for... There's actually a couple of... If you skip two questions down... Yeah. <laughs> um, she, I'll read the question to you. She said, related to doc searching, once I did find reference to clone, it was only one quick bullet on the features list, on the features tibbler, and it yeah, had an example it button, it. which in turn only introduced to her crazy new terminology of TW new tiddler message, yeah. which in the docs is actually referred to as an event in many places and not a message. And, you know, she looked at the documents for that TW New Tiddler message and was like, well, e yeah, that's that's what I want, but I would never find that. <laughs> yeah. Looking for how to copy, or I mean clone. <laughs> so, I, I mean, an interesting way to discuss this might be to step back up, actually, and think... Um, what I think this is this is partly a process question because mm -hmm. we know trivially that the documentation is um, uh, is inadequate, but what's the process? What changes can we make to make it easier to act on this type of feedback? Um, so, I mean, one thing is that uh, I guess. I mean, the, the, and one answer is that your girlfriend or you could have um, been here and got to the um, GitHub location, Ooh. which was wrong. Oh, look, it's wrong. No bug. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Sorry. Um, uh, anyway, to be able to click through to that tiddler. I wonder if it's broken for all tiddlers. Uh, interesting. Ah, yes. So it's to do with the legal characters uh, in that particular tiddler name, I think. So anyway, we could imagine um, yeah, one route uh, would be for people to come in and edit that, which I, I don't need to do that. Um, but, so, A, this could be much more prominent. There could be, you know, it's very conventional for, I don't know, documentation on the Mozilla Developer Network um, to literally have a little link at the bottom of each tiddler that's much more visible. Was this helpful? Can you suggest any improvements? Click here, kind of thing. Um, another possibility would be we could have a button that emails um, content updates at tiddlywiki.com with um, the, uh, well, so, say a button that pops up the tiddler allows you to edit it and then um, does a mail to of it. Um, but I don't know, I mean, what would be... Yeah, I mean, I think that, I think generally speaking, you know, we, we kind of agree that, that the solution to this is, is just sort of m more verbiage over time. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's very much a, a question of how do we broaden the the collection of that verbiage. Um, well, and I, I don't know. Is, is your girlfriend on Twitter? I'm sorry. Is your girlfriend on Twitter? Um, no, well, not really. Um, uh, but you know, she she is the sort of person where if she saw a um, help you know make a suggestion to help us improve these documents or, or whatnot type link she she would be clicking it so uh, you know I think that 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 may be a step in the right direction at least mm -hmm. okay I'll, I'll explore that because I, I I mean I think a pale gray link at the bottom I mean the, the documentation problems are so severe that the only reason to not do it um, would be that it's going to make it look a little bit um, messier. There's going to be some stuff on every tiddler, but only on tiddlywiki.com. Um, but given given the direness of the situation with the documentation, it seems that may be a small price to pay. So let me take a note to experiment with that. Um,
Jeremy, do, uh, you think that, second part. Oh, sorry. Jeremy, do you think that people that don't have a GitHub account will create a GitHub uh, account just to, to modify the documentation? I think the mail to uh, approach will be easier. Well, I don't know. A lot yeah, of people I, I, don't have mail to links set up, but but you, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've got some experience, as I'm sure we all have, of getting non technical people to use GitHub for things like this. Um, the only thing that makes me feel a little bit more confident is that I keep reading from GitHub people that they are very dedicated to making um, the editing flow online um, be as easy to use as possible. Um, and I think that it pretty much aligns with our reasons, is that they're interested in people at the edge of the of development projects who aren't actually programmers being able to contribute. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Um, uh, so I, th I think the first thing I'll do is to say, because it's an easy thing to try, um, is the help improve link. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and we'll see. I, I also I, I did read several several blog posts already where they discuss uh, GitHub for writers. So uh, yes, yeah, and and yeah, maybe maybe uh, let's say oh, start um, people uh, get get uh, more used to it. Yes, uh, maybe maybe. I mean um, I mean your girlfriend Nathan does sound reasonably technical. Um, yes, and, and she's, they, you know, she does have a GitHub account and is is sort of yeah. familiar with that flow. But you know, I think that she's probably somewhat exceptional. In, in exactly. That. I think a lot of people who could help us uh, are not going to be habitual GitHub users. But then I've noticed um, that a, uh, quite a number of the people who pop up on GitHub, you know, raising tickets and what have you, when you click through to their profiles, um, that. Fairly often, it seems that they've joined GitHub specifically to work with TiddlyWiki 5. Um, and I guess that's what you'd expect probably for any project, because um, the population of GitHub users is much smaller than the population of people who use software. But, um, um, one thing that, that kind of comes to mind, and, and maybe this is just um, a, a bit too on the nose, but um, maybe we just need, ironically, uh, a wiki for our documentation. <laughs> well, that happened last time around. So last time at Tiddlywiki Classic, we um, create we ended up. Um, oh no, no! Actually, what we did, would sorry, I'm confused, getting myself confused. Trouble with such an old project. Um, so a we created tiddlywiki.org as a media wiki instance, and um, uh, that was, I think, the right thing to do because at the time, tiddlywiki didn't have any kind of online multi-user mode. Um, but it made me very sad because it was uh, a dog fooding opportunity that we had lost. And so then, much later, when we got to Tiddly Space, we moved tiddlywiki.org onto Tiddly Space, and we also put the tiddlywiki classic content on Tiddly Space. So in fact, the um, the way to edit TiddlyWiki Classic content is to, uh, sorry, the TiddlyWiki Classic .tiddlywiki .com content is to edit the Tiddly Space and then do a build. Um, in fact, though, I think it was um, ended up being more trouble than it was worth. I'm mean, certainly finding for me working well, not exactly on my own, obviously, but you know, working with with you guys, other developers. Um, that it's much easier for me to have the documentation be part of the build, if you do what I mean, and to be reposited and so on. Um, but um, I don't know. I mean, if I had money for this kind of thing, um, a very reasonable thing to do would be for tiddlywiki.com to continue to serve the static HTML file, um, but to keep um, a Node.js instance running at, I don't know, admin.tiddlywiki.com or something, um, which uh, I guess could even have anonymous access and you know, um, then have a, uh, a staging view. And still, I guess I would want, I think tiddlywiki.com needs moderation, um, but it would be nice if that moderation was, um, you know, that I could, if I could do that moderation on my phone, I think that would keep things moving quite nicely. So. I think I'm saying 
Well, the, the, there's a couple of changes that we definitely need to make. I mean, after at the moment, I'm only updating the content on tillywiki.com each time there's a release, and that's clearly not adequate. I need to be able to update the content even in between releases. Um, so we, I will need to make some changes in this area, and um, yeah. Um, I think they'll be mostly be resource constrained changes. <laughs> um, you also mentioned um, uh, can we get a did you mean or search suggestions feature? Um, and um, I yeah, I would be quite interested in that. I mean, I'm guessing it's the kind of thing that we might um, expect to get if we had a full text search, if we integrated a full text search library. Um, and there's been some discussion about that in the past as well. Um, and yeah, I would be, I'd be pretty interested in that. I mean, even the, I don't know if you're familiar with the Soundex algorithm, very ropey, was mm -hmm. you know, the algorithm they use for censuses or something. Um, for searching titles, I guess even that might be quite useful. Um, yeah, I would agree, and I think that it's a, a feature that. Um, a lot of people just sort of have an expectation out of search for these mm. days. I think that Google has spoiled us all um, in that respect. Mm. Very yeah, much. I think I think uh, that uh, those libraries that really work are quite big. Yes, that, that's the concern, and they tend to, um, you know, that they'll, they'll place um, uh, the complications of making sure that they optimally get the opportunity to update their indices is mm. is likely to be a bit. I think. Better. I think. This, this is rather a server-side uh, solution that where, where you have a separate index. Uh, yeah, certainly, uh, certainly easier in that respect, right. yeah. Um, okay, uh, moving on. Right, okay, sorry, I'm seem to have scrolled up. Parser complexity often gets in the way, and figuring out parser rule lines is some sort of cumbersome black magic thing. Can we get some simple macro sets offering useful and common sane parser rule lines? For example, page template. Um, uh, and so this is, I guess, to talking about the way that certain templates like not that one, um, this one um, start with. Um, uh, a rules pragma, and you're saying that it's annoying to have to reproduce those rules pragmas all over the place in each separate tiddler where you need them. Um, and so, um, you know, it's 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 for me um, knowing the rule structure and knowing the flow of the parser and and so forth. You know, I can look at a piece yeah. of content and say, oh, well, you want this rule and that rule and this other rule. Um, so for her, go on, sorry. For for her, she's she's mostly been solving this problem by brute force. Yeah, yeah. So she's getting inadvertent wikification of things that shouldn't be wikified, and she's avoiding it by um, uh, brute forcing the right rules to disable um, the inadvertent parsing. Is that right? Yes. Yes. And and what what what's the content? What's the um, uh, I mean, obviously, here in HTML content, um, we get a lot of. <laughs> right. It's it's largely it's largely just that. It's largely related to her sort of. Um, and I'm glad that she's done this, but um, her sort of naturally um, falling into a workflow where she wants to very fluidly combine HTML content yeah. and wiki content, which, um, is, which right. is awesome that she's headed in that direction, but. It's created this problem for her. Okay, so there's um, one answer is there's a very old ticket that um, is about uh, yeah, sorry, not, not right, sorry. Um, there's a very old ticket about um, oh, vocabulary. Um, Okay, so the idea here was, I think, pretty much is, a, uh, is an attempt to solve precisely the problem that, that you're describing. So we may, uh, a given wiki may have um, multiple tiddlers that share with each other um, needing a particular subset of the available parser rules. And um, a concern was that doing that with the rules pragma is very... Um, error prone, 
Um, uh, but we need a technique that avoids the repetition but still makes it possible to transfer content to other wikis that don't have the same rules set up. So the idea was to, I now think it would be a separate field, so we've already got the type field and we'd have a vocabulary field, an optional vocabulary field, um, that um, would be either the URL of some representation of the rules that should be applied to tiddlers of that type um, or um, a the name of a tiddler um, that contains the definition of the vocabulary of the parse rules that should be applied. So um, yeah, I think that I think I I was rather, I, I ended up thinking it was more complicated than it needs to be because I was rather fixed on this idea of the parameterized content type. So what I've written here is a valid um, HTML content type um, that you can have, you know, like the char set parameter that you get on some text types that you can have these extra name value pairs strung onto the end. Um, but in fact, doing it that way just makes for a whole bag of hurt in terms of needing to parse these darn things where if we keep them as separate fields, we would not need to. So um, that's possible uh, uh, amelioration of the problem that I have considered. Um, uh, do you think that would do it? Oh, sorry, Mario. Ma, uh, Nathan first. Oh no, yeah, no. I think that absolutely, you know, addresses her need there, and um, I, I do agree that um, it's probably not best suited to using the the content type for it, um, particularly, you know. Uh, it's been interesting watching her um, uh, as a designer who somehow never really came to any understanding of content type. Um, it's been interesting watching her already deal with the sort of cognitive overload of all of the implications of content types on the web. Um, so I think not adding to that would probably be an ideal way to go. Um, That's interesting. Yes. That's, you just said that made me realize the degree to which we expose content type. And of course... Um, I am rather betraying the fact that I'm a developer to be to think that that's a um, an easy to understand solution. Um, I think I think uh, tell me uh, I think that the main problem at the very beginning is that you that you even have to find out um, which rules are possible. For example, if mm -hmm. I need to enable or disable something, I need to open the source code and and have a look at uh, export's name, because that that's the the name that you have to to use uh, to say uh, except or yeah or you do you do of course because we can't read the damn things here can we no and and so we we, we don't have um, documentation for the for the stuff so this was also with the with the if I uh, as I did split up the emphasis um, there was one thing which was underscore something like this um, the JS file is called underscore but uh, I, I did name it underscore. Uh -huh. the, I think it was underline or something like this, and uh, the JS um, had a different a different name at the very beginning. So this okay. is uh, no, I, no, except you have to. The, sorry, um, the JS file is called underscore JS, um, mm. and and the rule mm -hmm. had a different name at the very beginning. Mm. Um, but I think that we control. should absolutely expose in control panel. Advanced, we should expose a list of um, all of the loaded parse rules. There's quite a few like that. We also ought to be yeah. exposing the savers that are, that are fitted. So yeah. although there's some, you can get to them by obviously clicking on those shadow to, on those modules. There's yeah, not sufficient. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and 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 also describing this uh, would be a, a, an addition for, uh, for its own. So because uh, there is a lot of of experiments because in in uh, uh, at the end, you can combine uh, all of them. So you have the only and except, and then uh, you can yeah. mix and match it. So uh, yeah, it, it would be uh, one edition uh, <coughs> describing the rules on its own. Mm -hmm. And she's she's largely been just just manually making a list of of the rules as she finds them um, in TiddlyWiki's own tiddlers. Um, so largely, she's come to know about rules from doing things like looking at. Um, the portions of the the default yeah. page template and, and things of that sort, which is not a great way um, uh, to no. find that resource. 
No, I think um, uh, exposing it in the in control panel until we get to the point where we've got um, what do you call those things in Telesense, mm -hmm. which of course Code Mirror supports. So it is one of the things that we'd like to do. I guess that's probably the best we can do is expose in control panel. Um, uh, another question from Nathan's girlfriend. Um, I need a tutorial reference for CMS use cases. Can we make an addition with simple but pragmatic examples of a two to three page, not a wiki site, showing some templates, some simple content, some CSS and JavaScript, clean, static, HTML, export, render? I agree. <laughs> so one of the things that's on my list is um, to make a blog template for me, for germaline.com, and then to include it as a, um, you know, as one of the library, um, uh, uh, library, um, well, actually, it's not a theme. It's a library template, I guess. Um, I, and I was thinking these would probably be, um, you know, new additions. Yeah. Um, and and I think that that would fit that very well. I mean, particularly for for a new user coming in, having the option of of um, initializing a new wiki folder with a blog mm -hmm. example, I think would be great. And the there's a for people who are happy with Dropbox, um, there's some beautiful use cases of having your Tiddlywiki HTML file locally, um, spitting out your static site to Dropbox and getting Dropbox to serve it. Mm -hmm. um, so that I mean that's already on my uh, list of embarrassing things that I mean embarrassing that I haven't done it yet. Um, <laughs> do, do, do. Interesting question. So I want to transclude HTML content type, but it either doesn't work at all, or the iframe breaks, or drastically complicates the content. Can we get more flexibility in transclusion of web native content? So, um, what <coughs> what's being asked here is about if I create a an HTML tiddler, and I guess an easy way to create an HTML tiddler might be to drag and drop some HTML content. Um, uh, boom, boom. <laughs> Not that much content. <laughs> I wonder what happened there. Um, another bug for me to check out. Uh, okay, so here's an HTML tiddler that I've just imported. Open it, and you can see that it's. Uh, oh no. Oh no, it's got it's uh, it's come through as wiki text in fact. But let's give it the HTML content type. And as soon as we do that, um, this is now displayed in an iframe, um, and you can see that down here. So there's the body, there's the iframe, and the iframe is a data URI has a data URI containing the HTML content. Now. Um, there's not much we can do about this safely, many alternative ways of dealing with it. The problem is that um, we, this um, <clears throat> text HTML content isn't parsed by Tillywiki, and so that means that it can have the script tag in it. <clears throat> and if I close that, then I, the JavaScript executes and I get a script tag. Um, sorry, and I get an alert. Um, the, so obviously, we don't want people to um, be able, if we, if we directly transcluded this content by just copying this raw HTML, um, then um, we would be opening up this very dangerous possibility of people giving you a poisoned HTML tiddler that contains script that posts all your personal data back to um, a malware server. So the only way we can avoid the iframe is if we parse the, um, parse the content as, as wiki text, which is equivalent to 
just taking that content type off and uh, well, setting it to the normal to do wiki content type. Um, and then at that point, we get the expected behavior of the HTML content, and we don't get the alert. So those are the two choices. Either um, you, you work with sanitized HTML, um, in which case you're not restricted to an iframe, or if you want to work with unsanitized HTML, then it gets stuck in an iframe because it's not safe to do otherwise. Right, and, and the compromise that she sort of settled on was largely to, to you know, replace those content types and make them, um, you know, tiddlywinky content yep. type. Um, of course, then she just found herself back in the problem of, well, now I have to figure out this magic combination of rules <laughs> so that I, it parses, you know, as, yeah. So, well, one, one of the, th I mean, I, I think what I was about to say is actually the same solution. We're, even without doing the vocabulary handling, one of the things that we could do is have a tiddly HTML format. You know, just introduce a vnd.tiddlywiki-html, um, which uh, potted up those rules. And I wouldn't be against me, doing that. that. I think there would be a possibility, because uh, with tiddly space, um, there is a sanitation um, plugin, and it's not that big, so the, the, the library which, which does the sanitation um, would be okay as a plugin. So she could probably um, use the the iframe, uh, but first 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 do a sanit sanitation. Right, but she's not running on Tiddly Space. Pun? But no, she's no, not no, no, that's on... clear. But the, the the library is not that big. Oh, I see. Well, but but I mean, what Tiddly Wiki is doing by parsing this HTML is sanitizing it. Um, you know, one of the things that it does is to ignore script tags um, and to avoid um, JavaScript attributes and so on. So um, I I think um, I think rather than bringing in a, a, a fresh library, it is about um, limiting the rules um, basically. And I think that you know, I think that in her in her ideal scenario, um, you know, it, it it would just violate that security principle. Meaning, I think what she really wants to have happen is to not have the I framed and still have the script tag, um, which I understand yeah. is, is well. I mean, it's it's the sort of thing that in in lots of scenarios is perfectly safe. Um, um <clears throat> but I, in in it, so in the early Tillywiki Classic, I took the opposite approach, really, where intrinsically Tillywiki didn't make any limitations. Um, and then when, it was when we got to things like Tiddly Space that so we had to start thinking about those limitations. But right, I guess, to, allow it, to allow it in general is, is, is certainly not desirable. But it, I mean, it would be a very easy... Um, I mean, to make it so that it were, the behavior could be changed by a plugin would be pretty easy. And I think there's a healthy bunch of use cases, so either things like static blog rendering where you know, it's on your head BS if you use dodgy HTML, or people who are happy to take the risk um, in return for the increased flexibility. So I, th I think that would probably, um, probably be the answer. So let's It's not HTML sanitation um, to uh, cause transcluded HTML content to be transcluded directly without an iframe. Sorry, I'm exposing how clumsily I write things for myself, which probably explains why the documentation of Tiddlywiki is so weak. Um, <clears throat> girlfriend asks again, I need to be able to include alt tags on image and other semantic or non-standard markup like schema.org in my content. Do we have mechanisms for attaching arbitrary attributes or container tags to things in the render tree? That's very interesting. Um, uh, so I'm not sure if this is the issue that you mean, but there, there are many widgets that generate HTML elements um, that do not expose 
all of the attributes of those elements for you to assign values to them. So I recently, for instance, changed the button widget to, oops, um, ah, the wrong default, how annoying. Uh, updated the button widget to um, look for an a, a, um, attribute area label. Um, so you can see I was saving it there. And then up here, um, we actually assign it to the DOM node. And there's been quite a lot of this. It's a bit annoying. You know, I had to I added style to this one, um, and we've got title as well. Um, and there are many widgets that do allow you to specify the class. And yes, I think it would be quite useful to be able to pass through um, unknown attributes. Um, but is that the problem that you were yeah. referring to? And her her big sore spot in particular is is you know the alt attribute on images that was you know she was somewhat in disbelief that there wasn't a way to specify an alt tag for uh, an image in, you know uh, uh, in the um, wiki syntax. Uh, so in that um, I I was confused as usual um, by whether I should be supporting the title attribute. Um, or the alt attributes, no, they're, they're different, aren't they? I mean, they have yeah, different. And, and, and with her, with her workflow, um, where you know she deals a lot in um, media content marketing and the sort, um, she she really needs both, and the and the difference is is actually significant to her. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, here we go. That's um, a happily quite easy one. Sure. Um, but I mean that you know that that solves that. No, I know. But, you know as you mentioned, that um, all over the place, and we yep. really need a, um, a a more general mechanism. Um, yes. So I don't know. That's probably worth the ticket as well. Nathan, are you happy to try and do a ticket for that? Yes. Yes. That would be much appreciated. Thank you. Um, and I th the sort of thing I guess we're looking at, I mean, the, the nuclear option would be to for all widgets to pass through all attributes um, that are provided in the source, um, only suppressing, only doing the normal checks for unsafe attributes. Um, the one challenge is that there are some widgets that generate multiple elements. And so it's not necessarily going to be always clear which of those elements, which of those DOM elements, should get these extra attributes. But I guess you could probably do it on the outer one. Be reasonably safe. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. OK. Uh, so I think that's. All the questions, assuming these things are in. Oh no! You skipped one, one or two, at I've least one. Loads, because the new ones have come up at the top, um, and I didn't realise that. So I've been. I should have. I should have done them from the, from here. I think. Um, so going back up, we. I think. I think the only one of mine that you skipped. Um, oh. There was one about revision control. Oh no! I did completely miss that. Where's that? Uh, it says both of us ask. <laughs> uh, oh yes, the right side of the top. Yeah, um, revision control. Uh, yes. So, um, oh, the synchrotron. You're talking about. Oh gosh. Uh, so for people who. Um, Yes. So this is by Tony Garnick Jones, who um, did quite a bit of Tidlewiki collaboration back in sort of 2006, um, and um, it reflected um, uh, Tony's been interested in diff patch merge algorithms for ages, um, and 
um, what he did was update the TiddlyWiki store so that it maintained multiple revisions using diff patch merge. And um, yeah, I really like that. Um, and um, have every intention of including it in the core at some point. So but, you know, one further bit of background is um, there's the space has revision history and it's only on the server and not in the client. Um, so to get the revision, am I logged in? I think I am. Um, to get the revisions of this, I can click on revisions and I get a list of them. And if I select two of them, then I can compare them. So at this point, it's pulled in the diff from the server as a new tiddler. And if I want to just open, oh, that's the wrong thing. Uh, if I want to just open one of these other revisions, so there we go, um, then it opens the revision as a new tiddler with the revision number uh, appended onto the end. Uh, I've got very mixed feelings about this. For if you have an awareness of how TiddlyWiki works, it, it's quite natural. Um, and I quite like the way that we can expose all the required functionality of revisions without the client being aware of it. But um, I think the introduction of this sort of lightweight relationship between a revision tiddler and its parent is pretty complex. So there's no way by looking at this tiddler, as far as I know, to be aware that it is a, in fact, a revision of a different history, of a different tiddler. No, it's not. So the client um, is, if I edit this tiddler, um, it'll send it back to the server. I have no idea what the server will do with it. It's complaining, um, which seems reasonable. Um, so, yes, I mean, we need. Um, the idea would be we'd um, text reference syntax to um, allow a revision number. So I don't know, you'd do something like um, that would transclude revision 23 of the hello that didn't um, one of the concerns about it is that I'd like to be, you know, the, the great thing about this approach is that um, using this approach we can support a wide variety of different history, um, different approaches to storing history on the server and different approaches for identifying revisions of a tiddler. Um, whereas as soon as we move it into the core, um, we're going to establish a model for revision history that needs to be um, consistent with the model used on the server. Um, so there's you know, concerns there about if we had, if we didn't get that right, uh, A, it would make it harder to implement, to integrate TiddlyWiki with some other store that has revisions. So I mean, does CouchDB maintain revisions? I think it does. Um, uh, but I'm that the, I'm very interested in those kinds of cases. I think that it's very hard for something like TiddlyWiki to justify carrying around its own server infrastructure um, when you know server code is so difficult in so many ways compared to client code. And uh, the point I made before about Express, this desire to take advantage of um, knowledge embodied in in other projects that are doing similar things. So um, it's not <clears throat> what all that adds up to, I think, is that it's not something that I'm in any great rush to implement, but it's something that's uh, at the back of my mind whenever I'm thinking about the, um, you know, the inwardness of the wiki store and tiddler references and all that stuff. Um, and yes, it'd be really super. Um, also, I mean, the, the usability value of being able to revert. I mean, it is um, at the moment we, yeah, so yes, you don't need to persuade me, but um, you do need to persuade me that it's not going to be a huge amount of work. 
<laughs> well, I guess I mean I guess you sort of hit on on part of the core of my question is is um, uh, you, you know does Tiddly Wiki want to um, uh, make standard a, a model for for doing so? And you know if so, from sort of a ten thousand mile view, what does that uh, standard look like? Yes, so, I mean I, I'm I'm really into the space. I can't tell you where, but I believe that revision numbers are non-contiguous but ascending, um, and that's the one that appeals to me because that would allow a server to use a monotonic clock to allocate um, uh, to allocate revision numbers to each fresh revision that came in, if you see what I mean, um, or to have uh, a separate um, stack of revision numbers for each tiddler. So, but, so I guess... Sort of a, a, as a follow-up question, I mean, do you know one of one of the sort of core concerns here is is linearity of the history. Do do we want to enforce the linear history or not? Um, and and I'm much more inclined to say that that we don't. Um, that that we want to use something like um, you know hashes and refs um, uh, to support historical branching. Yes. But then, and then you get to the point where TiddlyWiki shouldn't be inventing stuff. You know, if we're um, the closer we move to the sort of functionality of a conventional DVCS, the more benefit there would seem to be from using that. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if there's, imp I imagine there's implementations of Git in JavaScript, but um, that is the, that's the kind of thing I, I think I'd be. Um, Looking at to support those use cases of a nonlinear history of a, of a you know true history graph. Um, if that also suggests that there would be you know, in that environment, you'd want perhaps to be able to express in the history things like merging two tiddlers, um, you know, rather than it just um, showing up as two separate changes. Interesting. Interesting. You remind me of because <clears throat> TiddlyWiki's been TiddlyWiki five has been going on for a long time. There's quite a lot of concerns like this that were um, very dominant in my mind in the very early days of you know laying out the boot kernel and so on. Um, but actually, I haven't always um, haven't been giving them much consideration recently. So they're quite. A useful time to be thinking about them. Um, okay, so let me. I'm. I'm got. I'll be needing to go in about ten minutes. So um, there's a, another question. Armchair designer saying um, GitHub seems viable for non-dev types, provided the intimidating factor of contributing there is lowered. Um, maybe a way to go would be to have a simple how-to for GitHub at hand from within to do wiki itself. I think you're right that the uh, so the the GitHub guidance that we have on tiddlywiki.com at the moment is directed towards people who are using GitHub because they're creating a translation and so on. Um, but let's simple guide to. Um, I think it's really just part of this, is that, that little banner um, that says, can you improve this content, um, needs to include the word help um, that links to a toddler with those instructions. Um, uh, armchair designer's second question. Um, do you have a rough idea of which popular classic TiddlyWiki plugins are most likely to be included as built-in modules in the 1.0 release package? So there's basically 5.1.0 is pretty much feature complete. Um, I'm not intending to add anything big, such as new plugins or anything. I mean, um, everything I say is provisional <laughs> and might change. Um, but um, Taking the question slightly differently, the uh, popular um, classic plugins that I would expect to um, migrate to TiddlyWiki 5 quickest, um, not so sure. I mean, there's an, a number of them are 
I think no longer necessary. So for each tiddler used to be one of the most important tiddlywiki plugins for lots of people who are trying to do you know, anything sophisticated with sort of lists and so on. And now the list filter, sorry, the list widget hopefully means that you don't need that. Um, don't know, don't know. Be interesting to see. Be very interesting to see. And some, I mean, actually, some TiddlyWiki plugins um, can also be done as just text macros nowadays as well, of course. Okay. And I think that we've touched on everything now. So, guys, thank you for those questions. Um, uh, Nathan, um, do not fear that you dominated the session by asking lots of questions. <laughs> I massively prefer um, I mean, prefer a hangout that is driven by the needs of the people at the hangout other than me. And as I've said repeatedly, the pleasure of hangouts for me is that almost anything that we discuss is going to be interesting for me. Um, and, you know, um, I pick lots and lots of um, useful um, uh, useful bits of feedback from these sessions, say pretty much regardless of the of the topic. Um, I'd like to just use the last few minutes to answer a question that Branimir asked before the Hangout started, which was, "What's the story for upgrading from TiddlyWiki Classic?" Um, and at the moment, the situation is that we. Um, have all these sort of bright green warnings telling people <laughs> to not attempt the upgrade. And to be honest, we'll probably um, uh, we'll probably end up um, leaving that there for quite a while because um, I think we're going to be a long way from. It's going to take a long time before we have a single click updater that works for you know, anything like the majority of cases. But there's two things that um, I think are important steps to getting there. One is to implement more macros within the core that mirror existing TiddlyWiki Classic functionality. Um, in some cases, of course, the TiddlyWiki Classic macros have taken um, names that um, we might want for our own purposes. Um, you know, for new TiddlyWiki 5 style macros with, with more flexibility. So the real answer is going to be with some work that I believe BJ was working on, um, which is around um, introducing <coughs> uh, TiddlyWiki 2 parser. So I think, yeah, here we go. This is it's a couple of months ago that... Um, <coughs> Uh, BJ lined up a um, an unfinished pull request, so it's here for inspection, but it's not included. Where he's um, done several things. He's um, uh, included the old TiddlyWiki Classic parser um, and um, made the necessary adjustments to make it work in TiddlyWiki 5. But what he's also done is started the process of adding widgets that duplicate some of the differences in behavior for TiddlyWiki Classic. So here you can see the classic transclude widget that, for instance, implements slices and sections. Um, and oh, it's really awkward to scroll this enormous page. Uh, what's this? A macro called entry. I'm not sure what that's about. Um, a bunch of macro definitions for there's the tiddler macro for transcluding the slider macro. So I think it's going to be hard work, but we need to do a lot more of this. Um, uh, what this guy is doing... I'm not sure what macro adapter does. But anyway, you can see the general drift of it is that um, I think has been working with uh, some, some specific TiddlyWiki Classic documents, I think, um, and has started the process of methodically um, uh, you know, moving across the functionality that, that is needed. So I quite like that approach, that um, we, we aim to have um, 
good support for tiddlers that are still in Tiddlywiki Classic format. Um, and we try as hard as we can to make as many of those tiddlers render correctly. And the fact that we're using the Tiddlywiki Classic parser means that an awful lot of that is you know, taken care of um, for us. Um, and that then we just gradually um, will add more of these um, widgets and macros to duplicate the existing functionality. And then for users who want to, um, they can one by one transfer tiddlers from tiddly new format. For that, it may be useful. Um, I think we discussed this at some stage to have a, uh, I guess it would be a button here that would um, do a one-off conversion and do the um, uh, line break duplication. So, so a button here that when I click it, convert would it would only act on TiddlyWiki Classic Tiddlers and it would change the content type and do a few bits of search and replacing to get those line breaks closer to what TiddlyWiki 5 needs. Um, uh, but basically nothing else is going to happen before the final release. So at the time of the final release, TiddlyWiki Classic people who want to upgrade to TiddlyWiki 5 will have to do that um, uh, uh, massaging of the content manually. Um, does that answer your question, Bradley? Yeah, yes. Great. OK, well then let me, um, just in the last couple of minutes, I'll just draw your attention to um, a few other minor changes lined up for um, 15. So um, one quite big thing is the ability to, um, so if uh, when we go into the plugin details, there's a disable button. When you disable the plugin, it gets this incredibly jazzy background. Um, and obviously, the disabling doesn't take effect until you save and reload. Um, but uh, I added that because um, in the aftermath of 5.014, we had people running into problems with plugins that weren't compatible. And um, you know, the obvious solution was a way to be able to disable them. Um, then a uh, 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 change I should have done for ages, I mean ages ago really, was um, making it so that when you're in the client server edition, the save button um, saves an offline copy that excludes the um, plugins necessary for the client server edition. So previously in 5.14, um, you'd come Oh, you'd have to be on the client server edition, and then the server tab, you'd find this um, download offline version. And so now you just click there to get to it. Um, the table of contents macro, uh, was, there's been some discussion about this in the group, but this is um, kind of a work in progress. So you may remember that the current table of contents in the sidebar is entirely. Uh, manually composed. So uh, if I look at the source of it, lots and lots of typing. And I did it that way to make things easy for myself. Um, isn't that terrible? Um, the plan is to uh, get this table of contents macro to the point where I can start using it for a dynamically built table of contents. So um, the first example, there's no expandy collapsey. You just pass it the, um, the tag uh, that's applied to the top level elements. So if we open that second item, you can see it's got the tag contents. And if you open second, one of the children of that item, then it's, got, it's tagged with second. So each child is tagged with its parent. Um, and then there's a variation where you dynamically expand and collapse. And you can see the frustration there is that I'm then invited to expand and collapse elements that don't have anything underneath them. So there's a further variant um, table of contents selective expandable, 
where it only shows the triangle, sorry, the arrow for um, tiddlers that do have children. So the, I, I need to do some CSS improvements to make that stuff all line up properly. Um, but I think that's quite important. It's um, this business of um, opening a present and then finding there's nothing in it is really annoying, I think. Will this go in 15? Yes, this is all in 15. Um, then, and uh, the plan, I, I hope to release 15 maybe this evening or maybe tomorrow. Um, the I made a change to the um, oh no, it's a very minor change that the that text up here is now translatable. The drop here text, um, the refresh button and the home button we've discussed, and then a bunch of bugs, including um, ton the foreground color for the tag pills. Um, and yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, so a few minor improvements. Um, oh, and obviously solved problem, which was that in 514 it's impossible to click on that down link, but I fixed that by moving the link outside of the main clickable area. So I don't think I showed this last time, but the plan Um, right, so this is this is a kind of a, um, a thought about what the next few weeks would look like. So um, I didn't put version numbers for the ones after 14 because there's always the possibility that one has to do you know an immediate release to fix a serious problem. But um, as you can see, the idea is that from now, from um, 5.15, we'll move to weekly releases. Um, and about two weeks before the launch, uh, we'll um, rename it a release candidate and we'll freeze features and focus on improving documentation and fixing bugs. And then come Saturday the 20th, we'll do the full release. And I'm, all, uh, what I'm thinking is that the full release will be 5.021 or something, um, but we'll just lose the um, dash beat a bit at the end, some version number, because the next round version number would be 5.1, which starts to look really silly. So I think that's probably me needing to go. Let me. Um, Turn off my screen share. Um, any other questions or comments from anybody? I have a request if uh, there's still time for this. Can you explain mm -hmm. during, the, during the update upgrade process, can you explain the meaning of uh, blocked and uh, the other text that is next to the checkboxes? And uh -huh. these checkboxes are allowed for clicking. So what will happen if I uh, check one which is empty and then check one which is checked? What, what is the actual meaning of uh, my options that I have as a user to upgrade to the next version? Um, okay, so the... I understand that in, in the best cases I could just proceed. Yes. But actually what is the meaning and why do I have some of them checked and some unchecked? Um, so let's do an example. I believe there's no documentation about this. So far. Um, possibly not, possibly not. So I'm going to install, oh, sorry, I'm going to try and upgrade an oldish version. Yeah, July. You need to screen share. Oh! <laughs> Perhaps uh, 13 course. to 14 or yeah. 13 to 15. Yes, actually, one of the things it should tell you is what the version number is um, that it's upgrade uh, that it, of the incoming file actually it would be quite useful um, gosh more messages from Google thank you so <clears throat> there's a few things going on um, the first is that it refuses to import any plugin where there's an existing version that's newer than the incoming version so um, it's possibly phrased clumsily 
but it's saying there's an existing version of the plugin that's 5.015, and because the incoming one, the one that you're trying to import, is older, we block it. Now, in fact, if you if I open the preview of that, you can see that um, it's actually done two things to block it. It's A, cleared that checkbox, but it's also cleared its content. So if I were to click that, um, then nothing would actually get imported. So it's been thoroughly blocked. Um, then the, the system tiddler history list we block um, is on a blacklist um, that we don't import the story list or the history list. And the reason why we don't inst uh, import the history list is because we were getting problems where people's history lists were just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and the reason why we don't import the story list is because we kind of don't need to. I mean, the story list is modified dynamically at the time that you um, uh, that the default tiddlers are read at startup. And so if we allow... It's something like clearing the cache. Uh, I guess. Something like this. Yes. Yeah, so it's, I mean, it, you, you, the, the, you, what, I guess we'd, we're saying that the story list is ephemeral um, because it's reconstructed each time TiddlyWiki starts. Um, then there's a couple of items here where there was a... The incoming plugin um, uh, was upgraded. And that's because upgrade.html includes all of the plugins in the TiddlyWiki library. So it saw there's an incoming plugin that's not in the current wiki, but rather than bringing in the 5.014 version that's in the incoming wiki, we'll instead use the 5.015 version, which is built into upgrade.html. So that's the mechanism by which um, plugins get upgraded, um, which is obviously very important. Um, up here, there's one. Oh, yes, yeah, so there's another upgraded for Cecily, and then the full screen plugin um, is obsolete. So in 5.013, the functionality of the full screen plugin was incorporated within the core, and so that means that the full screen plugin is now listed as in the blacklist. So here in the plugins, um, so these modules here, there's three of them, are upgrader modules. These are the modules that are responsible for all of these, the checks that we've just been through. So the plugins one um, goes through all the incoming tiddlers, looks for plugins, uh, checks whether the plugin can be upgraded from a newer version that we've already got. Um, it, suppresses the incoming plugin if it's older than the current one. And then finally, um, for any plugins on the blocked list, it just suppresses them. And then there's this system um, one that suppresses, uh, again, from a blacklist of titles of system tiddlers that shouldn't be imported. And then this theme tweaks one um, converts theme tweaks from the old 5.0. 13 format um, to the format in 5.014. So um, that's what's going on. It's um, what you're seeing there is is the, a rather blow by blow account of what the upgrade wizard has done in order to upgrade your content to the new version. So actually, blocked and upgraded means the same. It's just that the core will be upgraded, but uh we will not take the old core, or something like that. Uh, yeah, so the core is already in there, so it didn't need to be upgraded, whereas the the plugins that um, uh, were, aren't in the current wiki, um, they need to be upgraded. So, okay. um, yes, it's... Um, it's um, I guess the reason why it's... it's the distinction between a blocked plugin and an upgraded plugin, um, the this an upgraded plugin can only can only be upgraded by upgrade.html that includes the full versions of each plugin to do the upgrade. Whereas this check happens even if you do an import. So if I take so here here's the ordinary blank tiddlywiki and I just import that same um, 
same file that we were looking at. So now, look what happens, that the core is still blocked. Cecily was in the incoming wiki, and it's also already in here. And so in this case, that means that the plugin got blocked. They couldn't be upgraded because this file doesn't have the upgrade um, doesn't have the library of tiddlers to upgrade to within it. That's what's special about the um, upgrade.html. Okay, blocked. Uh, mm, block sounds uh, a bit scary, and I, I was thinking that whatever is checked is going to be upgraded. And I was wondering, I had the wrong perception, obviously. Why would I uh, don't uh, want to up upgrade my core or my? Uh, my history list or whatever, but it's uh, actually uh, we're getting the new one. Yeah, so I, I think it's the, I think the confusion really arises because we've got the same interface for upgrading as importing, um, because in an import context, you know that makes a bit more sense because you know you think of import as I've got a wiki, I'm adding other wiki other content to it, whereas here. It's phrased um, thing being older than the existing, but you don't really think of upgrade.html as containing an existing version of the core because you don't really need to be aware that upgrade.html even is a tiddly wiki. Okay, what 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 would be cases when I would like uh, when I would want to play with the check boxes? Um, would there be real life cases? Yes, yes. So. In a situation like this, um, it might be that I only that I want to import 20 of these tiddlers, but not the rest of them. So the sort of thing that we need to be able to do is to be able to do shift clicking to clear a whole bunch of checkboxes at once. I would also like to make it possible to do a select by tag, so that I can with a drop down or something select or deselect all the tiddlers that carry a particular tag. But that's for the future, right? Yes, so at the moment you just have to do it manually. Um, but it, um, it does allow you to be selective. So one, one of the things it's useful for is say here when I'm doing an upgrade and the upgrade doesn't work because I'm over, overriding some shadow tiddler. So um, at that point, you know, the easiest thing to do is to just untick it and try again. Excellent. So I must go because it is now quarter past. Um, let me unscreen share, which probably means that I'll straight away do something that requires me to screen share again. Um, uh, so uh, we lost Nathan and Ton. Um, uh, so that's that's typical of me being late. Um, I'm sorry. Like, oh, sorry, no, we didn't Tom, lose Nathan. Tom, we Tom. lost Ton only. Well, no, that's fine. So, guys, thank you very much for coming today. Really appreciate your time. Incredibly useful session for me. Um, very meaty today, actually. Um, and uh, obviously, look forward to releasing 15 in the next 24 hours or so, and look forward to your feedback on that. And we'll be having the next Hangout next Tuesday as usual, and as it said on the release plan, hopefully um, uh, 5.0.16 will come out um, then or nearly so. So, guys, thank you. Um, let's wave goodbye to everybody, and I'll press the Stop Broadcast button, and then obviously we'll still be online for uh, a few seconds after that. So, cheers. Thanks, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.